I'm going to live stream it to my YouTube. I'm just being okay. So now it should should be going. All right. So I want to read a passage from the wretched of the earth from Franz Fanon um, to talk where he talks about individualism. So Bismillah. Wherever an authentic liberation struggle has been fought, wherever the blood of people has been shed and the armed phase has lasted long enough to encourage the intellectuals to withdraw to their rank and file base, there is an effective eradication of the superstructure borrowed by these intellectuals from the colonialist bourgeois circles. In its narcissistic monologue, the colonist bourgeoisie by way of its academics had implanted in the minds of the colonized that the essential values, meaning Western values, remain eternal despite all, er despite all errors attributable to man. The colonized intellectual accepted the cogency of these ideas and there in the back of his mind stood a sentinel on duty guarding the Greco-Roman pedestal. But during this struggle for liberation, when the colonized intellectual touches base again with his people, this artificial sentinel is smashed to smithereens. All the Mediterranean, all the Mediterranean values, the triumph of the individual, of enlightenment and beauty turn into pale, lifeless trinkets. All those discourses appear a jumble of dead words. Those values which seem to ennoble the soul prove worthless because they have nothing in common with the real life struggle in which the people are engaged. And first among them is individualism. The colonized intellectual learned from his masters that the individual must assert himself. The colonialist bourgeoisie hammered into the colonized mind the notion of a society of individuals where each is locked in his subjectivity, where wealth lies in thought. But the colonized intellectual who is lucky enough to bunker down with the people during the liberation struggle will soon discover the falsity of this theory. Involvement in the organization of the struggle will already introduce him to a different vocabulary. Brother, sister, comrade are words outlawed by the colonialist bourgeoisie because in their thinking, my brother is my wallet and my comrade, my scheming. In a kind of auto de fe, the colonized intellectual witnesses the destruction of all of his idols, egoism, arrogant recrimination, and the idiotic childish need to have the last word. This colonized intellectual pulverized by colon colonialist literature will also discover the strength of the village assemblies, the power of the people's commissions and the extraordinary productiveness of neighborhood and section committee meetings. Personal interests are now the collective interest because in reality, everyone will be discovered by the French legionnaires and consequently massacred or else everyone will be saved. In such a context, the every man for himself concept, the atheist's form of salvation is prohibited. Self-criticism has been much talked about recently, but few realize that it was first of all an African institution, whether it be in the Dejemas of North Africa or the Palavers of West Africa, tradition has it that disputes which break out in a village are worked out in public. By this, I mean collective self-criticism with a touch of humor because everyone is relaxed. Because in the end, all we want is the same thing. The intellectual sheds all that calculating, all those strange silences, those ulterior motives, the devious thinking and secrecy as he gradually plunges deeper among the people. In this respect, then, we can genuinely say that the community has already triumphed and exudes its own light, its own reason. But when, but when decolonization occurs in regions where the liberation struggle has not yet made its impact sufficiently felt, 
Here are the same smart Alex, the sly, shrewd intellectuals whose behavior and ways of thinking picked up from their rubbing shoulders with the colonialist bourgeoisie have remained intact. Spoiled children of yesterday's colonialism and today's governing powers, they oversee the looting of the few national resources. Ruthless in their scheming and legal pilfering, they use the poverty now nationwide to work their way to the top through import export holdings, limited companies playing the stock market and nepotism. They insist on the nationalization of business transactions, i.e. reversing contracts and business deals for nationals. Their doctrine is to proclaim the absolute need for nationalizing the theft of the nation. In this barren national phase, in this so-called period of austerity, their success at plundering the nation swiftly sparks anger and violence from the people. In the present international African context, the poverty-stricken and independent population achieves a social consciousness at a rapidly accelerating pace. This, the petty individualists will soon find out for themselves. And I, I personally was quite struck by the sentence where he says individualism is the atheist's form of salvation. And, you know, he talks about the uh, type of like village councils or committees that they have. And I know in Somali culture, they call that Gurti, Islamic civilization, we've called it Shura. And it's a different system, right? It's a collectivist system. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that that's a very real problem. The, the issue of how do you navigate individualism and group interests, you know, especially when you have that tension between individualism and group interests. It, it works for the middle class or it works for, because the bourgeoisie it, it is an interesting concept in that Sometimes it means the middle class and sometimes it means those who are at the helm, so to speak. Right. You know, and so I really haven't um, mastered Fanon enough to know where he's applying that. Like what group is he applying that to within that context that he's writing in. But I think that uh, the the reality of where capitalism as colonialism has gotten us to is that it, it, you know, I think in this final phase is very clear, like, you know, they, with the assistance of people like Foucault and others, there's been a lot of damage that has been done on identity, but Foucault didn't start that. You know, that started way back with people like Descartes and others you know, the, 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 the redefining of the human being, you know, has been in the making for quite some time within the Western world. And even, even if you go back to like the Greeks, you know, the definition of who's a human being and who's not a human being in terms of who's a citizen, who's not a citizen. And that had everything to do with your survival. If you were part of the uh, polity or what, or were exiled out of it or didn't belong to it or you were not fully part of it. You know, it's a problem in Western culture, but I think it was exacerbate, exacerbated. And it's, you know, it's, it's mostly a certain type of, it's not all of Western culture either. You know, that's something that I think that uh, Ramon, Ramon uh, Grosfogel, he points out to that. Not all of European culture is aligned with the same philosophy. There's only segments that dominate, so certain segments dominate. But in any event, when we get to capitalism, the definition of the person uh, with, the, with the rise of modernity and so on and so forth becomes a serious problem. So that, that becomes an issue 
in all of this struggle, whether it's for women or whether it is for the Irish or whether it is for uh, the African in the diaspora or the Native American or the non-land owner, the, the whole issue of I the whole issue of identity becomes important. And so this system has done nothing but increase individualization. You know, not all, not, you know, individuality is not bad, but individualism as a philosophy, it has, it has increased with time, with time, especially as technology advances more and more. So the struggle with, against capitalism and its oppressive manifestation becomes a problem of how do you move people into a mass? That's what I think a lot of these writers, that's what they struggle with, the whole issue of overcoming people having individual interests and in coming into some sort of group ethic because you have a class that is operating at a certain level, but they're united on their, and so even if they're working as individuals because they have a common interest, they're working as a class. And that's part of the, you know, when you start getting into a lot of this, you know, sort of, sort of like Marxist analysis is that the bourgeoisie is the is part of the problem. It's part of the problem because they dominate, they dominate the society at, with their class interests. And in dominating the society uh, with their class interests, other issues come about because how is it that they dominate society? So in the colonial reality, you know, if you take that up seriously, individualism doesn't work for people because it doesn't allow them to overcome their situation. And the same problem comes up once again, you know, C. Wright Mills talks about that in the sociological imagination. And he's clearly a Marxian thinker as well. You know, but he, he comes up with the idea that you can have an individual problem, but when you have a situation in which all individuals in your circle are having the same problem, that's no longer an individual problem, that's a social problem. So it becomes a group problem. And that consciousness of coming into that, of understanding how the system operates, you know, is part of the, uh, the liberation process, it operates in, in isolating us from realizing that it's not just a psychological problem, it's not just me. Some of these things are social and some of these things are the consequence of these problems. They're the consequence of the, the, the stratification of the system, of how people are stratified, of how wealth is distributed, of how policies are drawn and so on and so forth. Colonialism in the time of Fanon it was a lot different because it, it was in a phase where you saw a different face to it, right? It, you saw a different face. So individualism definitely is the weapon of the bourgeoisie to keep the poor in their places. And what it does is it forces you to blame yourself for the problems that you're really not responsible for, but you're stuck with dealing with. You know, and I mean, he, he said a lot, you know, in that, in what he was saying, really he's speaking. But one thing I didn't know about Fanon to recently, Fanon was actually not poor. Fanon, in that sense, kind of was like Engels, you know, and that Fanon was embedded, you know, in, in the wealthy class. He wasn't poor. But I from, like the, Fanon, the passage huh? that I just read, was yeah. autobiographical on his part. Yeah, and see, and that's what I was going to say is that, you know, if you really check out what he's saying is that as an intellectual, he, he that's why I said a lot of the stuff that he said, it, it, it's just like he talks about Eurocentricity in a very limited sense and that, you know, the, the whole concept of like Samir Amin focuses, you know, it focuses on centralizing Greece in, in certain segments of Europe, specifically Western Europe. He, 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 call, he talks about the, the necessity to decolonize knowledge indirectly. Then he talks about how the, how the intellectual is pretty much lost with that, with, you know, you're lost with your education. 
that brings in the issue of decolonization of the university or or the the role of the public intellectual or the role of the intellectual in general and that's where a lot of us we get caught up in the degrees we get caught up in the and you see that you know the I'm a doctor I'm a this I'm a that the status of the and we and we we lose sight of what he's saying is being connected with the people and their experience and that's a and that's where that's where our man uh, Bor Ventura, uh, he brings up the whole issue of experience as being a valid source of knowledge or epistemology. But Foucault has that without say, saying it explicitly. Sufis he call say, it valk, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, be, having that experience, you know, and then that gives you, that's a good way of employing that kind of concept, the concept of valk employing it outside of mysticism You're right. you know what i'm saying um and, and so it's true like if you come into contact with the reality you know your language changes your your insight changes and i think that a lot of issues come up like that but it it, it is like he he jam-packed a lot of things in that in that selection that you pick there's a lot of stuff that's jam-packed into that mm-hmm. he's seeing so much but it just seems like a story. You know what I'm saying? It just yeah. it just goes, it, it just flows like, all right, I'm just telling you something. I feel like it was out of my just, just an account. Just a stream of his consciousness, you know, but it's, I felt like it was a very impactful passage. And when I read it, I said, we got to discuss it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I think that I, I would like to read it again. I think that the, I, I think that the whole issue that stuck out to me the most is, is the whole, the whole issue that the, importance of intellectuals is to not be disconnected from ex- the experience of people exactly right? especially those who don't share the same class interests as they do because as an intellectual first of all getting an education from the system automatically puts you in a different position you understand what i'm saying to understand it and being embedded and recognized by the system than those who don't have that orientation so intellectuals they they can work on the process of liberation, right? That's the whole concept of, of the proletariat coming into some sort of consciousness. Intellectuals, you know, can join the proletariat struggle as well. But it is is here he's showing us that intellectuals usually are about the status quo. They're usually about the status quo. And I, I personally I think that this comes up in a different context when you look at the I, discussion on the niqab that's coming up right now because of the Taliban. If you think about it, it's like who's supporting that stuff? If you look at the fatwa banks, if you look at what's being said, you know, it is like the, how intellectualization is co-opted to support a certain ideology almost automatically. There's no, there's not even any real thought involved in that. You know what I'm saying? Is, is somebody thought certain things as a so-called intellectual scholar, they recorded it, and then now everybody is just going with that, but it's supporting a certain status quo, right? And it's not even looking at the dynamics as they are in the moment. Like, what do people need right now? Where, where are they at? What when has, I think what about change in society, the Taliban, you know? I feel like they're the opposite problem of what France Fanon is talking about. They may be very well connected with the people, but they're not very well connected with scholarship or, you know, being intellectual. Uh, They're very anti-intellectual. They call themselves Taliban, but there's not a lot of Talaba going on. You know what I mean? Um, They haven't produced anything that's contributed to the intellectual space or sphere of Islamic civilization in the past 30 years. But that's, that's, that's the question. Uh, you know, and this is where if you find that the middle class and, and the, the 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 upper classes that were operating are more aware of the civilizational needs of society. That doesn't mean that is civilization for all, but in certain reforms that they were trying to push and so on and so forth, and they are aware that society where's that given given the struggles of the nation state and all of that. I'm not saying I agree with it. But I'm saying that what has happened is that you have a certain class interest that comes in 
and they use knowledge and their station and their position to try to align to colonial interests so that they benefit. Whereas the whereas in this case the Taliban are reactionary resistance group, but is not the resistance that is is liberatory, right? In the sense that the whole of the human being is not included in that whole dynamic that they're that they're talking about. Because you know it's like every time you know the the, the philosophy is one of the philosophy, even even with the communique that was issued recently, uh, we will do better on women's issues. You know, we we need to be recognized by the, you know, outside community. This and that. They themselves now are realizing that the same discourse that they had in the past and the same activities they can't present that face to the international community, right? And so now the question becomes: Are they in touch with the people enough? to understand that they themselves need to go through some sort of transformational process, right? To, to be in a position where they can actually serve the people. And yeah. that's the, that's been why. Huh? The, they've been in touch with the rural conservative element of Afghan society, but I, you know, they're, they're going to have to get in touch with the liberal people in Kabul and, and grapple with that. And I don't think that they're at that stage quite yet. But being in touch with the people, right? So then it becomes like, you know, are we, you know, are we living in a time period where some sort of agrarian, you know, an agrarian psychology is enough to run a society? Or a village mentality is that enough to run a society? And is that really in touch with the people or is that just a segment of the population? Right. And I think these are the challenges. I think that. I think that the intellectual begins to discover these problems of consciousness, right? Of understanding where society is at as a whole. And so here in this case, you know, that's why I think that the more you spend with the people, the more that you're with the people, I, I think that you begin to realize that you don't know exactly what may be the solution that you're in the process of trying to understand and work out liberation. And then you realize that you can't figure it out all in your head. You realize that you have to walk with the people and you realize that you need to be open to others. I don't know what that means in the case of the liberal camp or the middle-class camp, because I would say urban realities you know, understanding what's going on in urban realities is part of the challenge that they're going to have to confront. Right. You know, but I think that, you know, because the, because the, the, the liberal camp usually here is going to represent the upper classes and the upper classes don't really care too much about what goes on on the countryside of their state. It's true. You know, they, 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 you know, because if that was the case, they would have tried to integrate. But the, but the issue is that that society too that's why I was saying in another arena that they're stuck. The tribal realities and, and the local realities, the local consciousness is not going to allow automatically something to change in the society, which is that is stuck. You know what I'm saying? It has it has been able to exist outside of the international community's matrix. You know, it has been able to function independent of what we have to depend on. But that's the thing is that the, so so where does liberation come from in this case? You know what I'm saying? It, it, let's let's go back and try to read. Let's go back and try to read Fanon, and see if we can apply it to that somewhat. Yeah, I mean that's kind of what I'm trying to do right now. You know, by by looking at how he kind of conceptualizes individualism and. You know, he talks about brother, sister, comrade are words outlined by the colonialist bourgeoisie. Because in their thinking, my brother is my wallet and my comrade, my scheming. And what uh -huh. this made me think about is, you know, he's in the Algerian context. So I, these words are very common in, you know, Arab countries. And so I'm assuming he got that from his Islamic culture, you know, brother and sister. And <clears throat> when he says here that for the the colonialist bourgeoisie, uh, brother is my wallet, 
and my comrade, my mm-hmm. student, mm-hmm. it made me think of the history of capitalism. I've been reading mm-hmm. about the history of capitalism lately, and they basically said that the way that capitalism spread was that the system that developed in England forced people to mm-hmm. compete or Industrial die capital. from starvation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you didn't compete in this system being like put upon you, you were going mm-hmm. to starve and die. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it spread like wildfire across Europe and then to the Ottoman Empire and across the world. And what did we see? It spread first to Japan. Japan modernized fairly quickly. That's what that whole Hollywood movie with Tom Cruise, Last of the Samurai is about. China did not. China was massacred and slaughtered by the Japanese because of that. And it wasn't until really like Mao Zedong that they kind of got it together in that regard, in the sense that they were forced into this capitalist system, even though they they used Marxism to as a defense or whatever, however you want to frame that. That's when they industrialized, right? And capitalism forces this on all countries, industrialize or perish. And the countries that haven't industrialized are, in a sense, in perpetual perishing. They're what the bourgeoisie colonialists like to label as third world countries, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, they, de- they, they, live, they live in exclusion. Right. They live in exclusion and in um and they picking up language from uh well Ventura is the is the whole issue of the um the whole issue of the abyss and that is you know when you're outside of that system and so your exclusion outside of the system of, of when basically when you're outside of when you're on the periphery. You know, it, you're non-existent. You don't exist mm-hmm. in, in that in that in their reality. You don't exist. You're not even really recognized, and so you're excluded in this way, which basically makes you, you know, invisible. And so you, this is where the this is where I think that the identity stuff begins to come in as well. That you know, how do you make sense of yourself? when you haven't been, when you're not recognized even as, you know, a human being of standing. Yeah. And, and the same thing happens with the bourgeoisie. You know, the bourgeoisie, they don't acknowledge what they call the underclasses. They don't acknowledge them. They, and there's a lot of things that come up with that. They say you're, you're a failure because you didn't try hard enough. You, you know, you don't have the motivation. They, you know, there's a lot of different types of excuses that are given so that people blame themselves only. That's not to say that people shouldn't take initiative, but poverty in the capitalist system in the post-industrial age is not always something that is natural. It's not natural because of the amount of abundance. And that's what a lot of us haven't been, you know, we haven't been able to overcome the issue of how do we look at whether it's natural or not natural. It's about whether you have access or you don't have access. And what are the challenges to that access? You know, because we're talking about artificial wealth creation. It's not natural. It's not like holding somebody accountable for whether they farmed the land or not farmed the land. You know, and then whether they got crops or didn't eat crops. You know, we're not dealing with that type of that type of reality. And so the exclusion is it, the exclusion is it, you know is very real. Um, yeah, capitalism. It started with farmers, and it forced farmers to compete with one another. Right for you know making sure that their prices were at the right price so they can make money to survive and live instead of uh you know before that you'd have a landlord maybe with some physical military power who would just kind of extract taxes on the land and it switched to kind of this you know more capitalist system where farmers had to compete with each other in order to survive and that's exactly it's funny that you bring that up because i was reading uh an analysis of, of, uh, of Afghanistan. And that is how Afghanistan was, that you had lords, you know, and they owned the land, you know, and the same thing, that was the same problem in Pakistan. 
you know, and that was one of the criticisms that was waged at Maududi by the Marxists or by the communists. I won't necessarily Marx, say Marxists, but the communists that were there because th there was no re there was no redistribution of the land. Maududi never challenged the, you know, the uh, the landowning establishment. You know, so the the issue of just uh, redistribution or Again, access or and see, you know what? This is where we have to be really honest, um, because some of these things are prior to colonialism. Some of these structures are prior to colonialism, uh -huh. right? And so, the reality is that what evolved from the past, what kind of social structures evolved from the past. You get what I'm saying, and, and this is where this is a, the constant critique of, of of capitalists. They say, "Well, we came along and made things more equitable." That's neither here nor there, a hundred percent. But the but the the reason for bringing that up is saying that no, there was some sense of inequality that was not necessarily just prior to the colonial enterprise. That doesn't mean that the capitalists are right, but what it does mean is that we still would have to deal with that inequity. We still would have to deal with that injustice. You see what I mean? And so how, you know, how is it that we're coming into consciousness? It seems, it appears that now, it appears that what is bringing us into the consciousness is the effects of the, the effects of colonialism, you know, to the it, to, and capitalism is what's bringing us into Islamic some sense of consciousness. With this, you know, capitalism was kind of abruptly put onto the Ottoman system and it caused its collapse, more or less. And before that, uh, sure, there might have been various forms of oppression and inequalities economically and these different types of things. But why colonialism one of the reasons why it's so disruptive and oppressive itself is because you're not allowing countries or cultures or civilizations to use their own indigenous epistemologies to solve these forms of oppression you're not aiding them in that you're replacing their system with a completely different system and along with that comes their epistemology that erases all the indigenous epistemologies as being not even possible in their scheme, their their grid do intelligibility. If you want to use like Foucault's terms, grid grid of intelligibility or episteme, it, it erases the indigenous systems, right? And for me, that's the most harmful way. And I think that's Franz Fanon. What he was talking about here is, you know, one at a certain point when you connect with the people, even though you're Western educated all those Western ideas kind of fall apart when you start to see the indigenous epistemology, when you start to reconnect with non-Western ways of thinking, like he was in Algeria, you know, this brother and sister, like, you know, the, the, uh, that comes directly from Hadith, you know, whoever uh, loves for his brother what he loves for himself, you know, that's right from Hadith, right? And it's it's connecting. With yeah, the, yeah, the brother sister concept makes a more communal society. Right. It, it destroys the concept of individualism because what it does is it creates a system of bonds. That's why the language is important. It is. But I think that I think that the you know what I'm reflecting on in the back of my mind, and it's more just like loose thoughts. It is the problem of. We, we have a twofold problem. One is the issue of colonialism and its impact and its realities. And the other issue is that, but we have also our own internal problems. Some of them we inherit, you know, from prior to colonialism, which are not necessarily, you know, uh, their, their, their values or their practices, which are not necessarily going to achieve a liberation process. In other words, I'm gonna say I'm gonna go out on the line here, right? Because and this is important from an Islamic perspective. 
the Prophet وسلم, he didn't annihilate Jahiliyyah. He didn't annihilate everything that came from his culture. But he didn't accept everything as well. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I think that that's one process of liberation that we have to look at. You know, the other process of how we deal with colonialism is another set of realities, right? And disengaging from, from colonialism doesn't necessarily mean that if we've turned to, you know, indigenous realities, everything in that indigenous reality is going to get us out of that problem. Right. But the epistemology for me is what's important because you can appropriate, take whatever you want from Western thought, but it has to be subsumed under an indigenous epistemology, epistemological framework. Even if you have to change or maybe kind of upgrade or do what we call an Islam tajdeed to the indigenous framework, I still think that that framework has to be the dominant framework, you know, grid of intelligibility or episteme that we're dealing with. You know what I mean? And I feel like that, that that part I don't have a problem with. I don't have a problem with that party. I don't have a problem with that issue. The 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 we we're in alignment on that uh, that you know the 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 commitment. The commitment, what are you committed to becomes a point of question. You know, and so when you begin to re recapture or reawaken to or rediscover that's where the tajdeed thing comes in at you know when you begin to reconnect with what was indigenous exactly. you know it is it, it, something that it, the value of that is that that's born from your experience it's not someone else's experience that you can't connect to that's imposed upon you that doesn't even recognize you right but at the same time I think that all you know is always it has always been a question in recent you know within the last few decades. Can we go native after the fact? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, the postmodern subject is stuck in limbo, right? It's always our condition. So how, what do we do? And and that's why I think that I think that that process Islam, as at least Islam gives us tools. When the tools in between Islam and Tajdeed or or, or basically ameliorating because reform doesn't get it. The word ameliorating is to make it, you know, to bring something to a better condition. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, it, but and revival of what's, what's not being practiced because for us, our commitment is that the deen is not revived. The deen is not, uh, you know, there's no islah in the deen. Islah is in other things like in ourselves as human beings or in our interactions, but the deen itself guides us, you know, to uh, to to make that islah. It, it's a tricky concept, but I don't think that I don't think that we're going to be able to go to the past. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's kind of like I'm 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 talking to myself and talking to you at the yeah, same time. Yeah, these ideas that we can rewind things like a videotape and just yes, like, exactly. You know, but that seems to work. be that's that's a perfect metaphor. That seems to be where, if you really listen close, and that's why that's why I'm kind of semi lost in my own own thought here, in reflection, because that's where a lot of people are coming from. It's true. They 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 think that it's a matter of we're gonna rewind, and once we get to that, you know, part one, everything is great. That's it. We'll go back to some mythological golden age, and everything will be fine. Right. And that's another that's another metaphor that's perfect, that there's this that there's this that there's this golden age that we can get to. But there's another part of that. We don't even have to work for it. That's what some people call utopia. Mm -hmm. So we have we have we have like we have within our community, we have like these religious utopias. And that's the that brings yeah. up the question about the whole issue of the Taliban. You know. Where does that go? That's why in those talks that I did, you said that the that the that the uh, audio wasn't great. That's what I was saying is that th this is a work in progress. We operate out of principles. We don't, uh, you know, there's no I, there's no concept that we can go to some utopia in the past and recreate it in today's time. And a lot of people have that mindset, but that's why we're that's why we're getting stuck because we're not dealing 
with the here and now and the problems that we have. It's just like some of the analysts were saying that when they tried to impose upon Afghanistan this contemporary reality, they were negating that there's tribal structures and there's indigenous realities, Mm -hmm. right? That they're trying to wipe out and it's never going to work because the people are going to resist and they have the ability to resist that. But that doesn't mean that they themselves are representative. Like for instance, if we're going to talk about indigeneity, it's one thing, but if we're going to talk about that indigeneity representing Islamic value, that's another thing. And that's why I was mentioning that internal work needs to be done is not just solely an issue of decolonizing due to the imposition of an outside force, but it's also realizing now that we have another set of challenges, which is looking at ourselves and what we contribute. Right. And for Foucault, Foucault understands that psychology is in place. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Fanon, he understands that that psychology is in place that's there. That's right? why I'm very into psychoanalysis. Yeah, Fanon, we... Fanon himself was into Jacques Lacan. And I like reading Jacques Lacan a lot as well, because I feel like, you know, with the indigenous Islamic element nefs and also psychoanalysis that it, those are tools that we can use in, in that regard, right? I think I, I think that brings up the whole issue of, you know, that brings up the issue of, you know, how do we navigate that within the context of Islamic scholarship? That's why I don't like using the word tradition. Because the word tradition, the problem that comes up with that word is that really that is birthed out of modernity. Yeah, tradition versus secular. Yes, that's birthed out of modernity. That didn't and exist so, in the medieval period, even in Europe. So Islamic scholarship, you know what I'm saying? The reality of, of the scholarship, it it brings up a set of challenges, right? Of how do you deal with those bodies of knowledge? Yep, and so how do you deal? How do you deal with those bodies? And some some have said Islamization of knowledge. So we have Dean as our concept, right? Dean is not only what you believe, but it's like the accumulation of your whole life's actions, right? There is no secular versus religious. It's just Dean. And the Christians had a similar outlook in the medieval period in, in Europe, right? So this whole idea now that we have, you know, secular versus religious or secular versus traditional or, uh, you know, banality versus religious or sacred or, you know, whatever it's, it, these are all binaries that uh, have come out of the West. And that's kind of what um, uh, Jacques Derrida has always tried to use his, you know, concept of deconstruction and difference to try to navigate those binaries. But I say to hell with the binaries, right? We don't need those. We don't, I mean, we need to know how to deal with it, but that's not the platform we should be operating from. I think, I mean, I think, I think for people that are intellectuals, for, you know, not to put a rank to it or whatever, it's more of an activity. What Fanon is proposing is extremely important. And, and it's something that Abul Hassan Nadwi have brought up indirectly in his book, Saviors of the Islamic Spirit. And that is that Islamic scholarship, it was always most effective when it was in touch with the people. Mm -hmm. And every, because he did a biography, he did a biographical study of a number of different people that were said Islamically, historically, to have been revivers of the deen. Yeah, Mujad the deen. Yeah, and so each of them, you know, the, what they, what they had went through, what they had engaged in was they returned back to the people, you know, they returned back to the people and in returning back to the people, that's when there was a, you know, a, 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 a relationship between themselves and the people that allowed the deen to be understood in practice and allowed the deen to be vibrant. But every time there was a disconnect between scholarship and the people, that's when you began to see stagnation. That's when you began to see a number of issues. And so I think that I think that uh, Fanon is, is is warning us of intellectualism. And it's warning us of elitism, 
yeah. of not walking with the people, right? Of, of not being there with the people. And it's, it's interesting because the Black Panther Party was really a Fanonian reality along yeah. with Nietzsche. Fanon and, was and, mandatory and, reading for them. Yeah, and it, it, and it, along with Nietzsche and, uh, you know, Nietzsche, Nietzsche's will to power was democratized by U.P. Newton and it became power to the people instead right. of the as the will to power of the individual, the overmensch individual achieving that power. It became power to the people. And so he was not also, Huey, uh, Fred Hampton expanded that out even further because Fred Hampton, he was like all power to all the people. And he began a coalition of those who were basically being smacked by the system. Rainbow coalition. Right? And so, yeah, and the Rainbow Coalition. So Martin those Luther were, King wanted to do the poor man's march around the same time. Right. Those were those, those were some realities that they had came to philosophically that up to now we don't even understand the full right. impact of that because we're still stuck on individualism. And that's the issue with Jordan Peterson and, and company, that they they he's an intellectual for the system. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And that is about you and your morality. It's about you, you get just get your house together only and everything is okay. Like, why are you blaming, you know, just take responsibility for yourself and that's it. And there's no other, there's no other uh, interventions, no other reflections, no other thoughts. Uh, there's no other understanding the system's that fine, comes or it's, it's not capitalist enough. The, all the onus is on you as an individual. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that is where, you know, once, once we get to that point where we don't know where we fit, and how we're impacted or what we contribute to outside of ourselves. In reality, that's where a lot of the mental health comes in at. You know what I'm saying? Because how long can you continue to take that, whether, you know, that, that type of lifestyle on and, and maintain yourself if you're not, if you don't have a, a space in the system, if you don't have access? And it's, you know, or, it's or if you like, lose access, there are Muslims, I feel that fall into this kind of individualistic system by saying, oh, it's Qadrullah. It's out of my head about, you know, making myself a better person. That's just the Salafi side and where they focus all on Tezkiyat and Nafs and I can't change anything. I'm going to a political quietist type thing. Instead of but the, but the Salafis, the Salafis engage in that with the whole idea of just focus on Tawheed and that's it. And it's not all right. of the Salafis, of course. It's not all of the Sufis, of course, to be frank. It's a tendency of disconnectedness from the world. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? It's not always inherent in those groups, but it's a tendency which begins to manifest itself. And sometimes they take over those groups. Yeah. Right. They they take over they take over those groups. And even the same thing, like, you know, um, the same thing comes up with the whole issue of the whole issue of not properly preparing, but thinking if the system is changed and everything will be changed and that's it. You know, yeah. uh, and you don't have to do any. Anything. Only one piece of the puzzle. That's what Cornell West, he says, you know, conservatives, they just want to talk about black self-improvement without acknowledging the system. And Democrats just only want to talk when, no, we need to have both sides of it. We need to have the introspection and self-criticism on ourselves and changing our culture, as well as changing the system that hurts us. And that's, and that's basically, you know, that, that brings us full circle. That's basically what I was trying to get at earlier, that it's not, only looking at colonialism by itself is not going to do it. You understand what I'm saying? Or, or, or thinking that, a return to indigenous thought is going to do it. Because to be frank with you, Hitler, they tried the same thing. When capitalism failed for for uh, for Prussia, when it failed for Prussia, which was at that time at a high material point in, in the European reality, the, 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 the concept that they had was, let's, let's return back to our roots. And that was already a process that they were already engaging in. Nietzsche, yeah. Goebbels, Nietzsche, he had like a PhD yeah. in literature, and he took a lot from non-Western traditions. Ironically, yeah, they and they they were trying to go back either to 
the Aryan concept of trying to discover who were the Aryans. All right. Or they were trying to go to aspects of Greek thought, which were not Plato and Aristotle, like the playwrights and the earlier Greeks. Nietzsche was doing that. And then that was a way of deconstructing their Christian identity. As a matter of fact, they saw Christianity as a, a colonizing force. You know, they right. saw it as Jewish as a Jewish colonial effort on them, colonizing their minds. And mm -hmm. so as they so the return to ind indigeneity, again, it is like, how do you do that? You know what I'm saying? How do you do that in a world where the past is destroyed? Right. You know, we, we're still we will still have to be living in the now trying to figure out how we are going to move forward. And so that's kind of, again, is a that's, problem that's with Foucault which himself. Huh? Foucault himself, he says, you can't go looking after an origin. Origin doesn't exist. And you're only in the here and now. Right. And then Talal Assad, the anthropologist on the other side, he says, well, people who have religious traditions are doing a traditional genealogy and kind of doing some sort of tajdeed, you know, him looking at the Islamic system. But it, it's it's a hard balancing act that Islam every... brings another Islam brings another dynamic though. Because the because the the, the, the Islam Islam adds a, a different type of problem. And that is that because you have the sources of knowledge intact, right? The sources of knowledge were not disrupted. What was disrupted was the reflection on the sources of knowledge. Yeah. Right. And that hasn't been it hasn't been disrupted for the whole of the community as it's well. It's the hermeneutics that we need to revive in a sense, right? Well, I would say become acquainted with those with the Muslim mind, with those with, with, with that reflective process, that lived exactly. experience. That's where Zok, right, and Aql come together. You need to get back to tat wheel in a sense. The so tat wheel is re returning, you know, I will going back to the first, right? Right. And the and the and the original tat wheel, the original tat wheel was not imposing the intellect on the tradition, you know, of understanding, so to speak. Right. You know, for or to put it better said, it was not it, it was not it, tat wheel was not uh, initially just interpretation as it said in today's time yeah that's and, and, gi and giving it you know the ta'wil amongst the companions what was returning to the core of being mm -hmm. because what was apparent wasn't sufficient but that was expanded out and there was some sort of hermeneutic hermeneutical activity that entered into that and then it became creative you understand sometimes it defied the rules of grammar and defied the rules of uh, of of custom and sometimes it didn't it was acceptable at least within the, the rules of language mm -hmm. but that but that i think for us yeah i think that I, for us that it brings us back to the issue of revival touch deed and the issue of amelioration it, it, it's it's a different process i don't think other communities have that ability in the same way you understand what i'm saying and i've been watching some some communities try to reconstruct and where they go to reconstruct, it doesn't take them necessarily in the right way because their reconstructing process, it ends up becoming really bizarre. You know, it reminds me of the Quran Yun movement, right? In what sense? They tried to reconstruct, you know, what's the true Islam or Islamic epistemology. And they end up, you know, taking from people like uh, Ignaz Goldseer and rejecting hadith you know that it's it's kind of a we have to also be careful you know as to what we're doing when we say that's why that's why, that's why that's why the hermeneutical that's why that's why the whole hermeneutical the call for transformation of hermeneutics becomes problematic mm -hmm. in that you know because when you start talking about hermeneutics you're talking about two things. You're talking about the principles of understanding and the sources of understanding, and you're talking about the application of that, uh, you know, the activity of, of understanding. Mm -hmm. And so the, the 
the issue that we have is not that we need to reform usul and you know what I'm saying, or that we need to uh, re- uh, you know basically get a new set of usul. We need to get back in touch with it. The output of scholarship. That Conversations that, were... that I've had with with Hanafis, and I'm a practicing Hanafi, and I'm talking to other Hanafis about usul of fiqh within the Hanafi madhab. They're not even familiar with all of the like usuliyun in the Hanafi madhab. They're not familiar with all the usul texts out there. They know maybe like usul ashashi, usul bazdawi, but you have like uh, at Tahrir from Ibn al-Humam who made a radical change during the Mamluk period. Mm-hmm. You have mm-hmm. his student Ibn Nujaym who wrote like a muhtasar of that called Lub al-Usul and all these different things that they're not familiar with or they're not familiar with the usuli books written by the Ottoman scholars. But like see, this is this, this this is part of the problem too when we start talking about this concept of tradition, right? And, and, and I'm going to be a little critical here. If we were to take the Diobandi curriculum as the standard, it doesn't include any of that. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. You, may, you may see some quiet here and there. You may see some more. These army but, curriculum, right? Yes. But but you're locked into certain books, which that has its value, but yeah. that's not representative of the whole of tradition. Yeah, you can't think that's to use that everything. term. That's just the baby basics. Yes, yes, and and so this would the, you know the concept of traditionalism that we have before us. What it does is it blocks our ability to actually access Islamic scholarship because it's just keeping us to certain modalities of thought. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? It's Darcy not it's Islami not, is like a key that opens up a mansion to all the rest of the knowledge out there, right? Yes. It's not knowledge itself. <laughs> right. Is 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 the foundation exactly is the foundation from which to lump off to launch off of. But what has happened with the with the types of interpretations which have come been injected into that is that the keys of understanding are not in everybody's hand. Mm-hmm. So that's why they keep saying our elders, our elders, we stick with our elders, we stick Taqlid. with the kibar. Yes, and, and 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 that has its value up to a certain extent. But, but, but what begins to happen is when you try to apply all of that to life as is without looking at people's situations, yeah. circumstances, conditions, Tell that's where we begin to... Man. Yes, yes, that's where we begin to clash on a regular basis. And we begin to violate the spirit of the dean and the principles and sometimes some of the texts just head on. You know what I'm saying? So you have a, a, a battle with the principles and the spirit of the dean and, and what's clear in Islam New and so on and so forth. That comes about in society that we have to respond to. Whether you agree with it or not, the Sufi Habra came about as a response to the facade of the times. Right. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. in fiqh, it's the same type of idea that you have to respond to the, the facade of the times, the changing of culture in the times. Right. And I feel like that part is lost when you you overemphasize a taqlid that that doesn't allow for ijtihad fil madhab. Well, the now is missing right now. Yeah. The, 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 the reality of now is what's missing. In, in a lot of our thinking. You know what I'm saying? How do we deal with the now? Yeah. And then how, how are we talking about constructing? I don't think you can without the understanding future. the West. You have all this globalization, Western ideas, capitalism that's all over the world. And if you're not studying uh, the intellectual history of the West, I feel like it's hard as a Muslim scholar to deal with the now. It, you know, the, the reality of what we call fiqh al Mm-hmm. You know, is 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 exactly that. Fiqh al is that you have to understand what just took place. Exactly. You have to understand al hadath. Yeah. You have to understand, and, and, and so that takes us into two realms. That takes us into the tools to understand the here and now, and it takes us specifically into the necessity of understanding history fairly well, right? Because mm-hmm. if you don't understand historical reality, uh fairly well then understanding the here and now is also going to be a problem yeah exactly 
because and you're going we're, we're you're going. not going to understand yes yes or 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 you or even or even tap into the experience that allows us to see how things are repetitious right right because we know that there's different ways of reading Cycles. history it's not always just li linear and so on and so forth but there's different modalities of how we read history and you see that in Ibn Khaldun you see that in other civilizations outside of the Muslim civilization mm -hmm. so that and even the Quran teaches us to not fixate on history so much if we're going to take certain lessons of morality and so on and so forth but to take what is key but if we want to understand cause and effect then you know that the Quran is not just limiting us to that. It's, it's showing that history is important for, but within the context of belief and development, so on and so forth, it's important for X, Y, Z reasons. But when we start talking about other inquiries, like how do we understand the rise and fall of society? How do we understand you know uh, communal experiences, or how do we understand you know how to uh, build in a more specific sense? then we're going to need history outside of just looking at morality, mm -hmm. outside of looking at righteous people or, you know, a righteous person. We're going to need history to, you know, how did the Romans construct the world? You know, how did the, you know, Egyptians construct the pyramid? You know, how, how was, you know, why was it that certain civilizations in the Americas disappeared? You understand I felt the Abbasids, they understood this well. They went to the Greek texts. They went to the Persian texts. They went to the Buddhist texts and, and they were doing all kinds of genealogies and borrowing ideas, right? Well, they they opened themselves up to the world, right? And that's uh -huh. always, the, then now the tension comes in between, you know, different uh, civilizations and discourses and what that means for your own identity. Right. Is your own identity frozen or is it a work in progress at that point? You know, the, the, the construction of your identity as a Muslim, it doesn't necessarily mean, in this case, individual identity, but civilizational, cultural identity. Some people don't want those things. Mm -hmm. And in our discussions on religion, most of the time, people, what they, they don't care about, you know, uh, the necessity of mathematics and medicine, you know, the whole issue of how we need those things for the advancement of society, whether it be you know, in creating medicines or whether it be in constructing buildings or, you know, whether it be in advancing some other form of technology. That's, you know, that piece is not necessary for many people to understand. But we see, obviously, that without addressing that, we have major imbalances, like what we have now in today's time. You know what I'm saying? With, with, with the rise of mental health issues, with capitalism run, a muck, mm -hmm. you know, you know, all of those types of situations, they call us to question, is it is, is just talking about spirituality enough? Is just talking about God in a disconnected way enough? Or do we have to understand God in relation to the world? Do we have to understand spirit in relation to time and place? Do we have to understand, you know, our relationship to one another? You know, is it is it just enough to just talk about the hereafter? Is it just enough to talk about the here and now? You know, and so Islam Islam gives us a framework, that grid of, of legibility, so to speak, that is comprehensive, that is dealing with the whole human being as a whole, not just a part of the human being. Mm -hmm. And in and, and, and that I think Foucault wants us to get to that point of liberation. But Foucault is, is, is basically laying some really hardcore issues before us. Because Foucault is like, you know, you need to understand what you're going through right now, how destructive it is, and the impact that it has on you, and why it's stopping you from getting to where you're at. Why you are the why you are the rich. He highlighted the underbelly of modernity and like look at the disgusting things and put it in front of people's faces, you know. Right. And and I, I don't I don't think if, if that's if, if that's if that's not visible, you can never have a solid theology, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Like like Cornell West would say, you have to deal with the funk of life too. Yeah, you you know you you know if you you know if not, then you just relegate all of that funk to other. 
and you leave people in despair. Yeah. Because then now they have to work through the problem of why me in this situation. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's nihilism. What do you mean? It leads people to nihilism, hopelessness. And what you know, what what does when, when religion isn't dealing with the funk? It leads people to pessimism, right? You know, they're just saying they become hysterical. Why me? Who am I? You know, what am I doing here? What's my purpose? Yep, we don't realize that these discourses they they do lead to that and they lead to they lead to skepticism and they lead to agnosticism you know that's just the reality i don't i, I think that when the meaning when the matrix of meaning ceases to connect with the, the deeper levels of the human being it, i think it becomes a problem mm-hmm. you know that we confront that's where we're at. I mean, Western civilization has been there for a while. I think that the Muslims were shielded, but I think that the Muslims are there right now. I mean, if you look at the NPR study, assuming it to be true, right? The one that came out recently, the I mean, publication from NPR about suicide in the Muslim community. How is that a higher rate than other communities right now? Wow. You know, you have to realize that that is a consequence of everything that has been building up and, and, and not dealing with the funk. You know, that, that, that's not going to be dealt with by just escaping the reality. That's why we need Fanon. We need Fanon because Fanon is, is talking to us about the psychological impact of the underside of modernity. Right. You understand what I'm saying? The dark side of it. Mm-hmm. You know, the, 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 and so if we don't have that psychology in place, you know, we're not going to be able to have meaningful lives. Everything is just dark. Right, and right now we're we're in a very Nietzschean moment and that those who are doing OK are the ones that are creating meaning for themselves. But can you imagine a lot of the Catholics right now, what they're going through? when the leadership of their church is being collapsed? Or can you imagine, you know, the, you, can you imagine the, the, so many of the youth in the Muslim world that they, they're trying to get degrees and they have to pay, but it means nothing because they can't accomplish anything in their society. They have a master's and degree and they're a taxi driver. Yeah, and they're locked into a certain economic bracket and everything is dependent upon your economic bracket. Even me, I went to a very prestigious school, got a master's degree, hasn't changed my income at all. That's the reality we live in, in the modern system, right? Even if you go and do what you're supposed to do according to the system, well, you didn't inherit money from your parents, (laughs) right? You didn't get lucky and be the one guy who made a million dollars off of some fluke thing. You know, you didn't make the Amazon website or you didn't make Microsoft Windows or whatever. Yeah, and that that's the the challenge. The challenge that we have now is going to be that crisis of meaning. You know, what does life and Europe has been going through this challenge for quite a long time now. You know, what does it mean? You know, that uh, the economics, you know, could because Europe, European countries especially Western European countries, they're living in the shade of their empire status, whether it's France or Spain or Portugal or Britain. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're, yeah, they're living... Yeah, colonies right now. We just don't call them colonies, right? Yeah, we have colonies. We have internal colonies and, uh, and we have external colonies. But those countries that were empires at full blast, at full, you know, at full speed, they have had to retreat tremendously. Like if you look at Spain's economy now compared to what it was in 1497, 98, or under 1500s, it was at its high moment. You know what I'm saying? Spain's economy is is one of the most messed up economies in Europe. The same thing with 
you know, when you look at Greece and you think about Plato and you think about other things like that, those societies, you look at Italy, when you think about the Roman Empire. It was the ones who adopted capitalism the earliest that are still the most successful. Which That's ones? wild to me. You have uh, Britain, France, Germany, Scandinavian countries, and, you know, the Mediterranean companies were kind of late to the game, so to say. And it still affects them even now. They did yeah, very they, well under the pre-capitalist system during the age of exploration, the Dutch and mm-hmm. the, the, the Portuguese and stuff, but all that's gone now. Switch to a new system. We don't hear about the Dutch being a big, powerful capitalist economy, <laughs> even though they created the stock market. So then what, what do you, what does that entail? Then? I'm just saying those are just the historical ramifications of who got in, who, who started competing first in the capitalist system and who were latecomers to the system. It still hurts them even now. Just like black people that were enslaved in the trans transatlantic slave, you know, slave slavery, they they when they were late to the game, so to say, in the sense that they were enslaved and not allowed freedom, and they're allowed freedom la- later on, and it's still now they're into this capitalist system as people who are competing in a sense, and because they're late to the game, they're still impoverished among other things like Jim Crow and whatnot. But I feel like Jim Crow itself uh, and all these structural things that are put in place are part and parcel of capitalism. And I think I think too, like places like Spain with going through, you know, going through fascism, which is an interesting reality. You know what I'm saying? I think going through fascism, then you know, internal disruptions with different ideologies, whether it was you know the communists or uh, the libertarian communists and the fascists is something that I'm reading on now. Uh-huh. It makes me think about what happens with it when an empire starts to constrict and you can't maintain anymore how you have ideological divides you know that begin to create issues for you. And it's true what you're saying like because France still takes a lot from you know its colonies. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes it still it still takes from those colonies, whether it's people or money. Right. You know, and 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 uh, and Britain is an economic center. It may not be an industrial center, but it's an economic center. You know, I, I think that I think the I think the reality is one thing that is very hard to work through in all of this is what does a new world look like. That shit that becomes the that becomes I think the real question. What does the world look like? Even if the Muslims tomorrow were able to build something, that's why it's important to connect with the people, like Franz Fanon is saying, to go to the epistemologies of the South, or the non-Western epistemologies, because that gives us the tools to envision a world different than our own. Well, a world where capitalism is not dominant, right? Is, is a world where meaning has to become more important. Meaning has to become more important. You know, capitalism right now can maintain itself on a lot of fronts because meaning is not important in and of itself. Yeah, Lacan, he says that in order for us to be healthy psychologically, we need meaning or s- symbolization. It's when the real real creeps in and it can't be symbolized that it starts to cause problems, right? Or, or when the symbol, or what when we have a symbol for the symbol, and is mediated by the by you know currency, you have to pay to participate. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then it's like you're buying. You know, there's no a lot of these meaning. Uh, a lot of these routes to meaning, where they, you know, even if you look at something like the concept of the hero's quest, or whether you look at the concept of what is like the the Shaolin monk, or 
you look at the concept of the, you know, the, the philosopher, you know, there's some, in order to attain in these societies, the idea of attaining to meaning is not that you can buy your way in. You know what I'm saying? Like there, there it is about a commitment to certain transformative practices. And that's why the, you know, Protestant Reformation kind of got started in a sense is that the Catholics were saying you can buy your way in and people said, no, we want deeper meaning. And you had the, there was a 95 thesis of Martin Luther, right? Then the Catholics kind of changed over time and got rid of that, <laughs> you know, of buying your way into salvation, so to say. Yeah, and you know, I mean that a lot of where they were at prefigured a lot of where we're at now. Yeah, exactly. As far as socialism, there was prefiguring. As far as capitalism, there was prefiguring. The capital, the, the Catholic Church, had a lot of these ideolo ideologies embedded in their system. Right. That's just the that's just the bottom line. And a lot of the a lot of the collapse that they have is what we see in society. You know what I'm saying? A lot of the a lot of the issues that they have right now, problems of property, the role of women, you know, the issues of sex, you know, the issues of science, you know, how do you deal with change, you know, the issues of race, you know, all a lot of those issues that they had to contend or they kind of with or they kind of just uh, glossed over are issues that we're dealing with right now because they were in part the cause to the creation of those problems in the societies that we live in, because they did destroy the indigenous systems that were in place. You know, when they moved into different societies, you know, they, yeah, in the West, these changes took place over hundreds of years. And then all across the world, it was an abrupt cut to their system and superimposed with military might. So what we're, let, let, let's try Let's read uh, Fanon again, see Is there so, something in particular that you want me to read? I wanted to read at least part of that section that we were reading from, from the beginning, at least. So wherever an authentic liberation struggle has been fought, wherever the blood of the people has been shed and the armed phase has lasted long enough to encourage the intellectuals to withdraw to their rank and file base, there is an effective eradication of the superstructure borrowed by these intellectuals from the colonialist bourgeois circles. So and right there, what do, what do you think he's saying right there? That, you know, being in a liberation struggle forces you to connect with the people. And when you're amongst the people, you start to question a lot of the assumptions that you got from the colonizers. You, that system starts to break down as you see another way of being. Is it is it as you see another way of being, or is it that is broken down because there was, you know, he, he he's talking about armed struggle, right? To, and and part of that is to end, you know, the system, the superstructure that exists, and so it's almost like you're saying that without that. You can't have another intellectual reality emerge. The, yeah, that, and the that's two, what Foucault the two, says the, two with the, the grill the of intelligibility. You know, every time it shifts or moves, it makes certain things impossible as well as possible. Yeah, he's saying though that the he's saying he, he I think he's saying that the intellectuals are not going to come into consciousness properly until you have some sort of move to actually uphold the system. And those intellectuals are able to walk with the people. But he said, man, then he's saying there's a, he, he's saying that in order for this to, to take place, a new consciousness to emerge, you, you know, there has to be some time which is given to that. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. It allows you to see the new possibilities in a different epistemic structure.
and it allows you to see the impossibilities that was in the colonist bourgeoisie structure a lot more clearly, I think. All right, so then what, what does he say after that? It elucidates, right? It gives you lucidity about this sort of framework. So afterwards, he well, goes, you, you're no longer bound to the, I mean, you know, but the question is too, you know, I think the pandemic did that for us. Oh yeah, Zizek has written a couple books on that. He's, he, you know, has these, uh, I, might, I might have it behind me here somewhere. Um, yeah, he just titled it Pandemic, where, you know, he wrote about how it's kind of showing us that there are other possibilities, realities, and structures available. I think the pandemic, I think also. And in the United for States. The, for the Puerto Ricans, that. the hurricane did that. You know yep. what I'm saying? The economic uh -huh. collapse did that as well. So the question is that the, does it only have to be armed struggle, or does or are there other are there other experiences which are disruptive, which serve the same? I think Fanon would say there's other experiences too. I think he's just in this moment very caught up in his own context. Like I said, I think this passage is autobiographical. But so I, what does I, he say? What now? What does he say after that? After that? So he says. In its narcissistic monologue, the colonialist bourgeoisie, by way of its academics, had implanted in the minds of the colonized that the essential values, meaning Western values, remain eternal despite all errors attributable to man. The colonized intellectual accept, accepted the cogency of these ideas, and there in the back of his mind stood a sentinel on duty guarding the Greco-Roman pedestal. Right, and so... so so that's the fetish, mm -hmm. you know, that's where, that's where the system is fetishized. And, and this is where it becomes like religion. Yeah. And it's, and it, you know, it's, it's sacred and it can't be, it can't be uh, challenged. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there's no, it can't be challenged or it can't be questioned. And then, so... Fanon goes on to say, but during the struggle for liberation, when the colonized intellectual touches base again with the people, this artificial sentinel is smashed to smithereens. All the Mediterranean values, the triumph of the individual, of enlightenment and beauty with a capital B, turn into pale, lifeless trinkets. All those I wonder. Things. I wonder if he would say, if being in touch with the people, because Paulo Freire says that. Yeah. Paulo Freire says being in touch with the people. You know. Uh, the colonized does, intellectual touches base again with the people. Right, but he he made a precondition. He put another precondition, which is the disruption of the system. I don't think it's conditional as much as uh, correlational. Like again, I think he's talking if about it's his, correlational, if it's correlational. I think he's talking about his particular concept. I don't think he's trying to generalize it as wide as, as you're saying. If he, if it's correlational, then it opens up to other possibilities. Like we mentioned, that there are a number of different experiences that can disrupt the consciousness that dominates and that doesn't right. allow us to be able to make visible other alternatives. In this case. And this part that is mentioning now, the people themselves, being in touch with the people, becomes in part that experience. The question is, do you have to have a disruptive experience along with walking with the people or being with the people, you know, as a simultaneous set of experiences in order for uh, smashing the, the ideological hold? Is enough. It'll take longer, but I feel like you can definitely start to see another way of being. I think having an extremely disruptive or traumatic event just uh, uh, expedites it, right? 
and it depends. Everybody's got a different experience, right? But I think that that's what I've noticed in my own life, at least, in my own experience. So then what, what does he say after that? So he says, all these discourses appear a jumble of dead words. Those values which seem to ennoble the soul pro- prove worthless because they have nothing in common with the real life struggle in which the people are engaged. Mm. They just further oppress. They don't, you know. Uh, the ideological, it becomes an ideological disconnect. Right, exactly. Which, 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 no, which you can't, there's no affinity between you and it anymore. Like you, you can no longer buy into it. The, the, the illusion is shattered. And the, the, the first sentence of this the next is, paragraph, he says, and first among them is individualism. I wonder, uh, the question is why? Because, oh, because of the language. I think with the individualism, you can't no, have but, a unified struggle. No, but bring up the, bring up, uh, read the, 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 the section that comes next. So he says, all those discourses appear a jumble of dead words. Those values which seem to ennoble the soul prove worthless because they have nothing in common with the real life struggle in which people are engaged. And first among them is individualism. The colonized intellectual learned from his masters that the individual must assert himself. The colonialist bourgeoisie hammered into the colonized mind the notion of a society of individuals where each is locked into his subjectivity, where wealth lies in thought. But the colonized intellectual, who is lucky enough to bunker down with the people during the liberation struggle, will soon discover the falsity of this theory. Involvement in the organization of the struggle will already introduce him into a different vocabulary. Brother, sister, comrade are words outlawed by the colonist bourgeoisie because in their thinking, my brother is my wallet and my comrade, my scheming. Yeah, the linguistic shift takes place. There's a language that represents another reality with the people. Right. Yeah, the colonist uh, s- system of thought isn't properly symbolizing the reality that's in front of them. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And it, so, it, I mean, it says a lot that intellectuals are functionaries most of the time. Freud, he called it Kulturarbeit, the cultural work that has to take place. You have to have that. In- you know, uh, Fethi bin Slama, he wrote the book uh, Psychoanalysis and the Challenge of Islam, and he tries to psychoanalyze Islamism. And one of the things that he says is that in the Islamic world right now, very few people are doing this kultur arbeit, this, you know, to work through modernity. And mm-hmm. so you have a lot of problems that come out of it, and notably it's a kind of crazy Islamism. Uh-huh. And then, so then what, he, what does he say after that? But from what I understand is that, you know, there needs to be uh, further kultur uh, arbeit or cultural work in order to, for us to properly symbolize the reality that we're going through. And I think that's what decolonization is all about. See, Afro-pessimism you know, uh, one of the things that I get out of it is that it's about describing the reality as it is. Exactly, yeah. Nothing more, nothing less. That's how I understand it, too. And so that, that point that you just made right now, you know, about, you know, uh, about doing the work, it, it seems in part, it's, it, you know, the task is to just be clear on what's happening. Yep. That's part of the fiqh al And the intellectual is not clear on what's happening because the intellectual is serving as a functionary of class interests. Although the intellectual claims, you know, that he or she is, uh, is being objective. Like this was what the prophetic mission of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was all about. Well, he wanted to describe 
all the pessimistic or negative things going on in society and change them. People were killing their daughters. People mm -hmm. were using idols for money. People, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of crazy things were going on. And he, mm -hmm. he wanted to change society on a social level. It wasn't mm -hmm. just only spiritual level. Those, that dichotomy of like difference between spiritual and social, they, were, they weren't disconnected. Mm -hmm. the prophet muhammad mm -hmm. so they, they're not disconnected yeah, yeah and i think we have to keep highlighting that that's a very modern reality it yeah. doesn't mean that modernity because the hinduism had that as well but it's a very modern reality that we're dealing with um, you know Quraysh, like even just the the, the arabic root from like taqarrush or taqrish it, it has all to do with making money mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. these people they they in a modern terminology, they put profit over human beings. Yeah, the capitalists. Right? Even though the this is a free capitalist system, they put greed over human life and human suffering. And the Prophet mm -hmm. said, no, that is not what we're supposed to do. It should be flipped around. Human beings are more important than greed, more important mm -hmm. than property and wealth. Right? Mm -hmm. And he changed the whole of Arab society. Right? Or even you have, you know, uh, Sufyan converting and joining mm -hmm. the Islamic conquest. Mm -hmm. And even though the Sufyanids, you know, remained in political power later on, it still shows that the system was really changed. And I think that Muslims nowadays, they forget kind of the, the social elements of change, you know, or Islam or amelioration, like you're talking about, that is core and central to the Islamic mission, so to say. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And that's, I think, why Cornell West, he always says someone's a prophet or they're being prophetic when they're doing that type of work. Mm -hmm. And in a similar way, we, we could call it prophetic, saying that it's you're following the sunnah, sunnaic work, mm -hmm. right? And then Yeah, being a prophet becomes complicated it becomes a problem in Islamic theology, but I understand what you mean. You know, uh, it is prophetic work. I think, uh, you know, I think prophetic work is important to talk about it. What does it actually mean? You know, and Islam was all about the community. It wasn't about the individual and it is the total totality or, you know, the, 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 core concept, right? It was about Ahlul Sunnah, Wal Jama'ah, right? It was about Al Ummah, right? It wasn't a Ahlul Sunnah Wal Infirad, right? It wasn't like Jama'ah. Yeah, even and, even and even Omar even Omar's example of Tarwi and bringing people together. Exactly. Exactly. That you was know, a bidah uh, hasana, right? Tarwi. Yeah. I mean the 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 issue of bringing people together so that they're not alone. Communal prayer. Yeah, that, that says a lot. Exactly. And then, so, then, so then what does Fanon say now? What was the next section? So he says, but the colonized intellectual who is lucky enough to bunker down with the people during the liberation struggle will soon discover the falsity of this theory. Involvement in the organization of the struggle will already introduce him to a different vocabulary. Brother, sister, comrade are words outlawed by the colonialist bourgeoisie because in their thinking, my brother is my wallet and my comrade my scheming. In a kind of auto de fe, the colonized intellectual witnesses the destruction of all of his idols, egoism, arrogant recrimination, and the idiotic, childish need to have the last word. This mm. colonized intellectual, pulverized by colonist culture, will also discover the strength of the village assemblies, the power of the people's commissions, and the extraordinary productiveness of neighborhood and section committee meetings. Mm. Personal interests are now the collective interest, because in reality, everyone will be discovered by the French legionnaires and consequently massacred, or everyone will be saved. In such a context, the every man for himself concept the atheist's form of salvation is prohibited. Uh, 
Are we God's people or are we the atheist individual? I think is a binary he's trying to make. I think I think that yeah, this the I think the section that we read becomes a little more clear. No. Are we going to turn to a Nietzschean nihilistic subjectivity or uh, decolonizing uh, communal, communalistic outlook, right? And all religions have that, I feel. I think that's why he uses the term atheist. And honestly, that was seem to be like what the, you know, the collectives in Spain, that's what they did to protect themselves against fascism. You know, they 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 broke with individualism and created that collective spirit and that collective care and they were in cooperation and they were able to, you know, to to work through the whole issue of fascism because of that. I think fascism thrives off of individuality. It does. We we've seen it with Donald Trump just recently. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. <laughs> let's be our, you know, pessimist here. <laughs> Every man for himself sinks the ship. Oh, I should say, I'm sorry. I should say individualism, you know, more than individuality. Right? Individualism mm -hmm. is better said. I know what you meant. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, yeah, I think that it's, uh, I'm wondering, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get the date together. Is he refuting? I'm trying to see if they're in the same time frame. Is he refuting John Paul Sartre? Uh, you know, John Paul Sartre, he writes the preface to this edition. Um, and I do believe they were alive at the same time. I can quick look it up here. Because John Paul, his idea was that, you know, that you, the individual is just, you know, you got, you have to make a move for yourself, so to speak. Yeah, they were, they were contemporaries. He was born in, uh, says 21st of June, 1905. It seems that he was already in the uh, late twenties and early thirties active in academia. So Fanon, as far as I understand, wrote mostly in the fifties and sixties. Or, 50, or I think it's the 50s primarily. And that's even Nietzsche too, to be to be honest with you. So he died 1961, Fanon did. And he, and it, it, he's, you know, the, the, that quote about the atheist, that's even can be maybe applied to Nietzsche. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought of right away. It was Nietzsche. Uh, that Nietzschean subjectivity and nihilism. And I feel like that's kind of the dominant episteme in, in Western discourse nowadays. And then it's kind of what's been added with that is postmodernism of Foucault and, and Derrida and that type of stuff. We should continue reading this like this. We should continue reading it. Inshallah. I think we had a, a good discussion and Hopefully people will benefit and maybe we can get some more cultural arbeit going, some cultural work to help ourselves as an ummah. Yeah, I think I think that, you know, I think that uh that point of the nihilism, I think it, it, it it's uh because see You can you can you can engage that path just for just pursuing individualism. That's it. It's just, and that's why he talked about narcissism because it just becomes about you. And religion can be transformed into that. Mm -hmm. You know, religion can be transformed into the it, cult of the individual gain. It can salvation. go into this vacuous religiosity, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're it's we're not in the context egoism. where. That's what the Uma is with all the arguing. It's just a form of vacuous religious egoism, right? Right. You know, that that's you know, that's a, a serious problem that we're in right now. We we can't overcome ourselves and see each other. 
Mm-hmm. We, you know, we don't have the problem of the group smothering us 100%. That's not our problem. That was in a different time period. This is the problem of the ego yep. smothering us. Yeah. You know, and it, it, in the bene- and, and individualism benefiting um, our own destruction. Yeah, maybe, you know, if we, we could read The End of the Cognitive Empire, you know, by uh, Boaventura de Sousa Santos in a way like this, uh, see if our other companion will be willing to maybe live stream or record it or something so we can do stuff like this, do some cultura arbeit. <laughs> The only thing is, like, reading like this will take us a long time to finish. But what we can do is... I feel it's more productive, though. No, I think it's... I, I mean, it is more productive. The so-called traditional approach is this. You yeah. Know, that you, you take segments and you, you study them pretty well. This is what the Ra'i did. Ra'ita Fikeza Fikeza. Right? They discussed it. Whatever they're reading or thinking in a, in a communal way. And the Ahl al Hadith, they were you know, I'm hadith still, each other learning in a communal way. I'm still, I'm still trying to figure out, and I'm left with a couple of questions. I don't think we maybe can handle that right now, but so then what is Foucault proposing, you know, as an alternative? I don't think Foucault proposes an alternative. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, not Foucault, Fanon. I don't oh, know why I keep own? saying people. Yeah, an uh, alternative to individualism and to the atheistic, the atheistic individualism. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd have to read further on, which I haven't done yet, um, to kind of see what's his answer. Well, why don't we regroup on that piece? What sure. page? Can you send me the page numbers to that? Yeah. So this is the wretched of the earth uh, English translation, and it's. Uh, Grove Press uh, says preface copyright 1961, forward copyright 2004. So I guess it's a 2004 edition. And the page numbers that we focused on was 10 through 13. Mm, Okay. Whoa, that was a lot. And I'll put that down in the description below as well for the YouTube video. But anything else? I think we kind of concluded. Yeah, I want to prepare a little better for next time. We should, we should try to come back. All right, I'm going to end the live stream here.